we first hour started studying the deity of Christ. And I'm going to review just high level what we talked about first hour just to get us back uh, all on the same page thinking about it. But Jude is calling us. David uh, walked us through Jude over the last months, calling for us to commit, contend for the faith because there are ungodly people in the church. So they're not outside the church. Ungodly people who have crept in unnoticed in the church who are responding to grace with acting immorally and at the same time and probably as a result and sort of rationalizing that denying Jesus Christ with a false teaching that rejects his authority and specifically a teaching that seeks to lower his status in some way to make him more like them so he has less authority in the same way that Korah said hey we're no different we're all holy right or Cain spoke against Abel or Balaam spoke against Israel these false teachers are speaking about against Christ lowering his status saying hey you're not as glorious as we had maybe previously thought and so your authority is less than maybe we might have thought we explained why someone might turn grace into licentiousness we talked about uh, the Israelites leaving Egypt but met a desert and similarly those who have received a promise of eternal life and eternal joy but don't see that and in fact may see suffering and persecution more than they had before um, might look for pleasure in other ways and that's bad enough but to then teach and, and hurt others in the same way is even worse and we gave examples from first corinthians 5 and from some second century church fathers clement of alexandria and irenaeus who spoke about contemporaries of theirs of theirs who were in the church but acting sensually and with lewdness. Now for the latter, for the second part, which we spent most of our time on, denying the Master and Lord Jesus Christ, we didn't get past ex explaining what that was, what it meant to deny Christ, to reject his authority, or why uh, that might happen. We didn't get yet to examples of it, and that's what we'll do this hour. So we're going to sort of talk, talk a little bit about history, but a little bit more review before we get to that. Uh, the teaching which denied Jesus Christ was equivalent to rejecting his authority. Jude 8 talked about that. Um, it was done by blasphemy, uh, reducing the glory of Jesus. We gave the examples. We said it was by dreaming. They sort of made it up. Uh, it wasn't uh, God's word. It was speculation. It was a very serious thing to do this. Uh, <clears throat> destruction. They lose the father. The archangel knew better than this. To, to blaspheme lower divinities. They're like bulls in china shops. And because it was serious, we need to contend for it, even though it won't be easy. Now, I do want to say one more thing, which we didn't say first hour, in preparation for the history lesson that I'm going to share, and that is, there was a time, uh, the New Testament says, there was a time, at the time, there was one church, one doctrine, one faith once for all delivered completely unified it was it wasn't uh, the idea of denominations or differences of opinion or it was one revelation it was one faith that all the apostles held and taught this is the only time we'll actually be in the scriptures this hour which i know is not normal for us but uh, we'll just mainly be talking about some things from history but i do want you to turn to first corinthians one for some of you this is review from when we had a lesson on 1 Corinthians 11 together. And we, we looked at the book of 1 Corinthians as a whole and we said, hey, what's 1 Corinthians about? And, you know, how can that help us understand a really hard topic when we study the head coverings? So 1 Corinthians 1, you remember in verse 10, Paul sort of lays the thesis, begins laying the thesis of the book. He says, I exhort you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all agree and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be made complete in the same mind and in the same judgment. So he's writing, his purpose in writing is that people are saying different things. They're thinking different things in the church. And he doesn't want that. There's one faith, there's one doctrine, one Lord, and we should all be of the same mind. <clears throat> but they're not. He's been informed, verse 11, that there are quarrels and dissensions. Some are saying, hey, I follow Paul and I follow... Apollos, or I follow the Lord, or I follow Peter, right? And Paul says, no, 
Christ isn't divided. We all follow Christ. There's one doctrine. I don't teach something different than Peter. I don't teach something different than Apollos. We all teach the same thing, and we teach it everywhere. Because what they were saying is, hey, the apostles have scattered, and Paul says this over here, and Peter says this over here, and Apollos says that over there. And, he, and Paul says, no, that's not the issue. The issue is not. And, and I'll read some scriptures here that show that he says, no, I'm of Christ, I follow Christ, and you can follow me. And we teach this everywhere. Every church teaches this. Just listen and hear how various verses in 1 Corinthians. I won't, I won't share the references. I'm just going to say the text here. He says, in Christ I became your father through the gospel, so be imitators of me as I am of Christ. I've sent to you Timothy, who's my beloved and faithful child of the Lord. He'll remind you of my ways, which are in Christ, just as I teach everywhere in every church. And thus I direct in all the churches. If anyone's inclined to be contentious, we have no other practice, nor have the churches of God. As in all the churches of the saints, let the women keep silent in the churches. As I directed the churches of Galatia, you do also. So he says throughout the letter, this is what we teach every church. We all believe this. We all, the apostles, we all hold the same doctrine. I need y'all to do what's right. In fact, the issue is not the apostles. The issue is y'all. Y'all have sin in your midst. The whole thing we read earlier about the sensuality and the immorality. Y'all got to repent. You got to kick that person out and you got to be thinking the same thing. The issue isn't with the apostles. We're not divided teaching different messages. The issue is with you. Now, Jude, that's the time period in which Jude wrote. You know, he says there was a, a, a faith, the faith, that was once delivered, once for all delivered. It wasn't to change. And they, these false teachers, are fracturing, fracturing that. They're dividing the church. Second Peter 2 1 says they're introducing heresies. Heresy is a sect, it's a different way of teaching. It's um, a heresy is a sect. The Greek word heresy is, speaks of a sect or a division, and by extension, we use heresy of the, the doctrine that makes someone different. Jude says in verse 19, they cause divisions. And as you know, that was everything I just said is true in Paul's time, true in Jude's time, is not true anymore. Right? I mean, 2,000 years have passed, and you can't say that anymore. It's very difficult to say there's the one faith still exists, don't get me wrong, but it's very difficult to say, hey, there it is. You know, what's one really prominent example of someone who says, here it is, this is the true faith? Roman Catholicism, right? It's the Catholic Church. Catholic is a Greek word. It's kata alas. It means according to the whole. And there was a Catholic faith. And you'll see, uh, we'll hear in our text that I share today from history, people talk about the Catholic faith. They don't mean the Roman Catholic faith. They mean the universal faith that was true of all the apostles at the time. But it's not necessarily true anymore. In the same way that the Israelites were warned like, you need to stay separate. Don't mingle with the nations. If you mingle with the nations, it's going to lead to trouble. And, and they did, and it led to trouble. In that same way, the apostles were really interested in maintaining unity, maintaining purity, because often the lack of purity, sensuality, led to a maligning of the truth. That didn't happen. And as much as we had some heroes of the faith who did contend and kept it better than it would have otherwise been, to a large degree, the church has become divided. Maybe you've seen this meme before. Noah sends me memes every day. I don't know if anybody else is in that category. Uh, he has not sent me this one yet. It may be difficult to see. But it's basically mocking the idea that anyone today can fully get the Bible right, as it were, or lay claim to the understanding of the faith once for all delivered by the apostles. And there's a lot of truth to the meme. There is a number of divisions in the church. It, it, this is not uh, it, it makes it can be sent around as a meme because there's some connection to truth, and there can be an arrogance in at this point, and even our thinking, hey, we've got everything right, because likely we don't. You know, I'm, I know there are things that we don't have right. I just don't know what they are, um, but you know, there can be arrogance in that, and even you know, Frank and David and I, we are very similar, but we're not. We don't believe on every. You know, there's some small things we disagree on, but. Regardless, there's also a lot of error to this meme. It is not a fool's errand, even in this environment 2,000 years later, to fight and contend for the faith. To say that you shouldn't contend with vigor to try to understand the apostolic doctrine and proclaim and defend the faith, or to push towards a unity that's not devoid of doctrine. That's the general call, right? Mm -hmm. Hey, it's, we're, this is what it looks like, so forget doctrine. Let's just all come together around the name Christ mm -hmm. or something like that. 
No, I mean, when you love someone, you truly want to know them. You want to understand. And um, yes, there's a lot of differences, but even some of those differences are not material. And so we don't want to overstate it. Even in the early church where we said, hey, there's this purity, this apostolic uniformity and consistency. Like you hear Paul saying, hey, some people worship on this day, some another. Like there were differences there, right? They were not material. Um, and so the non-material differences today, we don't need to you know, be, a, be ashamed of, right? There were differences in that day. But properly honoring Jesus as master and Lord, not denying him, is not one of those immaterial questions. It's not in that category. It's one of the two things Jude said you need to fight against. We have to hold fast to the proper honoring of Jesus based on what's written, not dreams or imaginations. And that's the purpose of the next four weeks together. Now, today, we're going to look at three early denials of the divinity and the authority of Jesus. There were other uh, such denials, other um, heresies, to use that term, that came. Frank mentioned one last week, y'all may remember, that will, uh, is, is related to our three, was docetism, from the Greek word dokeo, which means to seem or to appear. Remember when he was talking about the crucifixion, some people were arguing, you know, God can't die. There's no way. So he just, it was a phantom. He just, he appeared. He wasn't really flesh. He was a spirit that just looked like he was crucified. And First John, you know, he says, hey, you have to confess that Jesus came in the flesh. And uh, so docetism was uh, one early one that we won't talk about. These three are specifically about how Christ relates to God the Father. And therefore, his nature and his authority. And each of these will go from worse to better. Though all three are outside of the true Catholic, using that term in the, in the real sense, they're, they're all outside of the Catholic faith, that, in my estimation, of Jesus' nature, out of, out of step with orthodoxy, we could say. But they go from worse to better, nonetheless, even though all are bad. Uh, and they go from easier to refute to harder. So easier to contend against to harder to contend against. The first and the third are named after the person who sort of founded the idea, Marcion of Sinope and Arius of Alexandria. And the middle one is, is, is named after the actual doctrine itself, which we'll study, which we'll talk about very briefly. So we start with Marcionism. Marcionism began, it would be the first of the three, the first to kind of come. It began maybe as late as 144 BC, but the first half of the second century. So Jude would have written, been written, I don't know, 65 AD. I said BC just a second ago. I didn't mean to say BC AD. Uh, Jude may have been written 65. So this would have been another, you know, 65 years, 70 years after Jude wrote Marcionism. This uh, completely severed the relationship between God, as revealed in the scriptures at least, and Jesus. It was for sure the most blatant attempt at rejecting the authority of Jesus. So Marcion said, "There's this world is an awful place, and in the same way that um, I thought I had this on there, I think it's in a quote that I'm going to read. Yes, in the same way that a good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, there's no way that the God who created this world could be good, right? And so I reject the Old Testament scriptures. I reject." almost all of the New Testament scriptures other than a portion of the Gospel of Luke and 10 of Paul's epistles. And Jesus is in no way associated with the God of the Old Testament. All the promises of a Messiah to come, those were awful promises. Uh, Jesus taught the real way, you know, the way of forgiveness. There's no judgment. Um, this was Marcion. And, you know, this was, like I said, it's going to get from easier to refute to harder, and it's going to get from worse to better. Again, I want to always clarify, none of these are good. This one was really bad and really easy to refute. I mean, this guy is, he's making it up as he goes. You know, this is, he's, he's rejecting everything that's written. He's making it up as it goes. Um, let me give you a couple quotes. Uh, Tertullian was a North African uh He's from uh, Carthage in North Africa. He was a little bit later in the third century, but he, he's writing about Marcion. One of the things that God used these heresies to do is to refine uh, you know, our understanding as a church of true doctrine. So as an example, Marcion comes on the scene and says, mm, no, none of these are scriptures. This is all junk. And so the church had to say, oh, what is the scriptures? 
And so they had to kind of come together and say, well, these are the ones we've always been reading and recognized as came from God. We need to write that down, you know, uh, because we had never written down a list. And so the first sort of canons of Scripture came because of Marcion's challenge. Let me read Tertullian, around 208, around 200 AD. Marcion has laid down the position that Christ, who in the days of Tiberius was, by a previously unknown God. In other words, Christ didn't come... He's not related to the God of the Old Testament. He's not related to the God we've been talking about. That God who created the world, he's a bad God. He's related to a different being who we didn't know previously. He was revealed for the salvation of all nations, and he's different from him who was ordained by God, the Creator, for the restoration of the Jewish state. Again, the Jewish state, like that's that's not good stuff, right? It's all immaterial or uh, you know, the idea of a nation that God might choose. No, right? That's what, what he's saying. Between these, between the God of the Old Testament and, and Jesus, he interposes the separation of a great and absolute difference. As great as lies between what is just and what is good, as great as lies between the law and the gospel, as great, in short, as the difference between Judaism and Christianity. And then St. Hippolytus, uh, just shortly after, um, I don't remember, I think he was from Rome, St. Hippolytus, I don't recall, Shortly after Tertullian, Marcion affirms that the good being, this un previously unknown one, has made nothing at all. For it's requisite that the things made should be similar to the maker. So they enjoin or employ the evangelical parable saying a good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit. And Marcion says that Christ is the son of the good being, was sent for the salvation of souls, which is not, again, what we believe. I mean, it is, but it's more than that. God is going to restore our bodies as well. He's going to resurrect our bodies. And Marcion asserts that he appeared as a man, though not being a man. That sounds like docetism, right? He seemed like a man. And as incarnate, though not being incarnate. And he maintains that his manifestation, his appearance, was only fantastic. And not fantastic like fabulous with an F, but fantastic like a phantom with a PH, like a ghost. It was fantastic. And that he underwent neither generation. He didn't, uh, he wasn't born nor passion. He wasn't suffering on the cross he just appeared that way and he will not allow marcion will not allow that flesh rises again he denies the resurrection but in affirming marriage to the destruction he leads his disciples toward a very cynical life and by these means he imagines that he annoys the creator if he should abstain from the things that are made or appointed by him now this is the easiest again to refute I and mean, where did he get these ideas from is it from the scriptures no, no, he's, he's dreaming, right? He's making this stuff up. And it's possible, it's not easy to confirm, I wasn't able to, I could find at least, but I read that he was the son of a bishop, a church elder, elder basically, who himself was communicated by, excommunicated, disciplined by his father because of immorality. I can't confirm that, but again, we wouldn't be surprised based on what Jude is saying, that those two things, I mean, why would you want to get rid of the judging God of Revelation or the Old Testament, well, if you uh, were immoral, then you might want to get rid of those ideas. And again, these denials of Jesus go from worse to better, um, all unorthodox, also easier to contend against until harder. This was a, a serious issue for the church. And again, God used it for good uh, in establishing more firmly the beliefs of the church. But it didn't continue. It didn't continue, and it didn't make it today. It's not really relevant today. There's not po folks that are following Marcion's canon or you know, teaching the doctrines that he taught. So we're going to go on to the next, which is adoptionism. Marcionism completely severed the relationship between Jesus and the God of the Scriptures. Adoptionism separated the two until God chose in time to adopt Jesus. So it didn't completely sever them. It just said Jesus was a man, a normal man like you or I, a normal human, I guess, uh, like you or I, until he was baptized. Because of his pious life at his baptism, God adopted him as his son. And he had a special relationship, a special nature from that point on. He came a little after Marcionism. Uh, he, of course, as a result, denied the virgin birth, right? He was just a man. Uh, he denied the pre-existence of Christ, right? You know, uh, that, that 
Christ had an existence before his birth. I, excuse me, I shouldn't even speak that way. That Jesus <coughs> had an existence before his birth. Because as we'll see, they use the term Christ to mean the logos or the word or the divine nature came upon him at his baptism. And that's when he was different and distinct. But before that, he was just a man who was born not of a virgin, but of Joseph and Mary. Let me give you a couple quotes here from the Panarion of Epineus of Salimus. They maintain that Jesus is really a man, as I said, but that Christ, who descended in the form of a dove, has entered him, as we have found already in other sects, and, and been united with him. Christ himself is from God on high, but Jesus is the offspring of a man's seed and a woman. That's adoptionism. Now here's a quote from the same work that seems to tie uh, them to, I'll call it, licentious doctrines uh, as well. They compel them to give their children in marriage. These are the, the leaders of this heresy. They compel them to give their children in marriage even when they are too young. And they do not allow people to contract only one marriage. Even if someone should want to be released from his first marriage and contract another, they permit it. They allow everything without hesitation, down to a second, a third, a seventh marriage. Which maybe it's kind of weird, like really, but I mean, we Mormonism is is not much different, right? At least in its early forms, they allowed multiple marriages. They believe in some really odd things about how Christ, you know, it's generated uh, from or generated in His existence. So there's it seems weird, but I mean, there's some weird ideas that still exist today, um, and perhaps this quote is you know, little as we know about adoptionism. Perhaps it shows that they had some kind of weird things going on in terms of. Uh, breaking some, going past some written things, past some authorities that God has set in place around, around marriage and sexual sexuality. Again, not quite as bad as Marcionism. Really bad, still. Don't hear me saying that, but not quite as bad. At least, uh, at least they, you know, don't completely sever the relationship between God and Jesus, or discard most of the scriptures. Um, and also a little harder to refute, but not hard. Right? All it takes is uh, a little bit of slow you know, reading comprehension, maybe you could say. You know, like, I mean, if you read Matthew 1, 18 through 25, it's pretty clear. Before they came together, Mary was found. I mean, there are folks today, Hebrew Israelites, others that will deny the virgin birth of Christ, even today. And again, it's, it's, it's very clear. Um, before they came together, Mary was found to be pregnant, pregnant by the Holy Spirit. The angel said, the child who's been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. Joseph took Mary to be his wife, but kept her a virgin until she gave birth to a son. I mean, you couldn't make it more clear if you were trying to show that Jesus was not born of, of a father. You, you couldn't be any more clear. Or when it comes to pre-existence, John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. John 17.5, the glory I had with you before the world began. So again, a little harder because they're not just making things up. They're just kind of maybe ignoring some things at this point, some really basic things. And again, this is what Jude said would come. And, and you know, it seems easy enough, but people fall for it. People, adoptionism had a following. Marcion had a following. And Jude, I mean, people from the church, people that had, you know, believed and been baptized and were part of the church, they were falling prey to this. But the church rose up and contended against this view as well officially condemning it in a synod, which just means a gathering of church bishops or leaders in 268 AD. And you'll still hear about this view sometimes in modern times, but it's kind of in pockets. You know, maybe this person on YouTube believes it, but they don't, um, you know, there's no official that I'm aware of, official group that sort of this is their doctrine under. Would, would you say that these people were never saved in the first place since we can't lose our salvation? Did they just maybe think they were saved and that's why it was easy for them to drift over to these these different ways of thinking that's what i would say yeah yeah they went out <clears throat> from us because they weren't of us and um you know paul in first corinthians 10 you know talks about the example of israel like every one of them made it out of the promised land. every one of them was baptized in the red sea but a lot of them fell a lot of them didn't make it because of unbelief and he says, you need to stand firm. I understand that you're a member of the community of faith. You've seen you know, works of the Spirit around you. You've been baptized. I got it. I got it. And I know that God keeps those that are his. But you get arrogant and you start arrogantly believing and saying you know these things. And you, like that's a bad sign. And that means that, yeah, you were not really a part. You'd never truly come to know. 
So uh, it's going really fast. That's good, right? I mean, we're not going to be here forever, but this one's a little harder, the last one. Certainly the best of the three. I, I still think it's bad, really bad. And heresy, I would even use that word, but, but certainly better, which makes it harder. And uh, harder to refute, in my opinion. It's called Arianism. Uh, it began in a little bit later, the last of the three. It's almost like the heresies you know, started really bad. They got knocked down and they would refine them until they got to this one, which was really hard. It took a lot of work um, to get to a, the right understanding, to understand you know, the nature of Jesus and how he relates to the Father. It was the last of the three. It began with a, a guy named uh, a bishop in Alexandria, Egypt. Um, his name was Arius. And uh, he, he said, you know, he had high regard for Jesus, really high regard. He believed that he was born of a virgin, believed he was glorious in his preexistence, believed that he was the one who created all things, but just came a little short and said, but Jesus was himself the first creation. He's not a co-eternal with God. He, you know, he was the first thing that God made, the most glorious thing that God made. And then Jesus made the world and all other things. Really high regard for Christ doesn't deny many of the things that we hold to. It doesn't deny the virgin birth. doesn't deny that Jesus had a glory before he came uh, to be a, a man. They had a kind of a, uh, a catchphrase which was, there was when the sun was not, or maybe a little better English, there was a time when the sun was not, you know? That was sort of the debate. Like, was there a time when the sun was not? Was there when the sun was not? There's a, it's an If you don't like history, you would like this time period anyways. It was fascinating. It's fascinating to read about. There's a guy named uh, Alexander of Alexandria, kind of funny name to be, the Bishop of Alexandria. He was the Chief Bishop, Alexander of Alexandria. And he had a deacon in his church named Athanasius, who was um, really the hero in this story. Alexander was opposed to Arius. Alexander eventually died. And Athanasius took up the charge in the fight against what we would consider the true doctrine of Christ, and that he's eternal, uh, uncreated. But there's some really interesting intrigue and uh, uh just funny stories, honestly, during this time period. I, I do not have time to share them, but I'm going to whet your appetite and share two teasers. Uh, you know, there was much ado recently about Will Smith. Remember at the Oscars? Uh, slapping Chris Rock? Well, legend has it that the Council of Nicaea, has anybody heard of the Nicene Creed or the Council of Nicaea? It was the, the gathering of the church. Constantine had sort of become a uh, an adherent of the Christian faith that we could say and he gathered the church to deal with this Constantine wanted the church to be unified because he wanted Rome to be he wanted you know his nation to be unified and he as opposed to Diocletian and others before him who thought man these Christians they they make things hard let's kill them all he thought opposite I'm gonna I'm gonna invest in the church and I'm gonna make sure the church is unified and that's how I'm gonna keep peace in my realms so he gathered the Council of Nicaea, and legend has it that St. Nicholas, you've all heard of him before, from whom comes the Santa Claus, Santa Claus <laughs> that he lost his temper and slapped one of the Arians <clears throat> at the council and received his very similar discipline as Will Smith. You know, he had his, uh, he was disciplined for such an out, outrage. Anyways, another story, Athanasius, who I just introduced, um, he was opposed any way he could be and the unscrupulous attempts of the Arians to oppose him were not just based on theological argumentation they tried everything they could to uh, to get to him to slander him um, listen to this recounting of one incident it's, it's in an article by John Piper called Contending for Christ Contramundum Against the World Exile and Incarnation in the Life of Athanasius finally Athanasius' enemies resorted to intrigue. They bribed Arsenius, a bishop of a city on the Nile in southern Egypt, to disappear. Why would they do that? What do you think they're going to say? They're going to say Athanasius knocked him off. 
Okay, they, they bribed Arsenius to disappear so that the rumor could be started that Athanasius had arranged his murder and cut off one of his hands to use for magic. Constantine was told, Constantine was the emperor, and asked for a trial to be held in Tyre. Meanwhile, one of Athanasius' trusted deacons, Athanasius had risen to the bishopric after Alexander died, and one of his deacons had found Arsenius, the supposedly dead man, hiding in a monastery and had taken him captive and brought him secretly to Tyre, where the council was. Tyre is a city on the Mediterranean just west of Israel in Syria. At the trial, the accusers produced a human hand to confirm the incident, indictment, excuse me. But Athanasius was ready. He said, do you know Arsenius personally? Yes, they all said. So Arsenius was ushered in alive, wrapped up in a cloak so that only his head was exposed. When he was revealed to them, they were surprised, but demanded an explanation of how he had lost his hand. So Athanasius turned up his cloak and showed that one hand at least was there. There was a moment of suspense, artfully managed by Athanasius. Then the other hand was exposed, and the accusers were requested to point out where the third had been cut off from. <laughs> I mean, it's just, it's just interesting history, and uh, but serious, very serious history. And Athanasius was exiled five times. Uh, through all the different intrigues that happened. Here are some quotes. Uh, Athanasius, uh, Andre and I were talking this morning about, uh, you know, writing people and what, uh, you know, what tone to use and things like, well, Athanasius, uh, these were his enemies and he wrote, uh, he wrote straightforwardly to him. I'm not saying to follow these patterns in all communication, but he, he was, he was, he didn't mince words. He said, Arius has dared, has dared to say, the word is not the very God. Though he's called God, yet he's not very God. But by participation of grace, he as others is God only in name. And whereas all beings are foreign and different from God in their essence, so too is the word different or alien and unlike in all things to the Father's essence and propriety. He belongs, Jesus, the word, belongs to the things originated or created. He's one of these. Afterwards, as though he had succeeded to the devil's recklessness, I just didn't, I didn't finish that quote, but just to show, you know, he's talking the way that Jude did. Like, this guy is, he's being reckless. That's not how you talk about Jesus. You don't, you don't say that. The, the Bible doesn't speak of him that way. So I understand, like, maybe it's hard for us to wrap our minds around how Jesus is the Son, but is eternal. I get it. But don't talk that way. That's reckless, he said. He further said, God was not always a father, but afterwards became. The son was not always, because he was not before his generation. Generation doesn't mean like 40 years in these texts. It means like the begetting or the beginning of somebody. He is not from the father, but he as others has come into subsistence out of nothing. In other words, like I was created out of nothing or the trees out there were created out of nothing. God created things out of nothing. He's saying Jesus was created that way. Whereas, you know, we would say, and if you read, I was reading during the volleyball game yesterday, this where, and you know, he, Athanasius makes the argument, hey, when a, a human mother has a child, does it come from the outside external to them? Or how does it work? No, no, it comes from inside, right? And he's saying, hey, it's the same thing with God. It's not, he has a son. It's a part of his being, as it were. Again, we can't figure this out. Like this is all ineffable divine things that I, I can't explain to you. But he doesn't, it's not an external thing. He doesn't create them out of nothing like he did trees. It's, it's his son. And that's the way sonship or daughtership works. But Arius said, he's not from the Father, but he as others has come into subsistence out of nothing. Wonderful is heresy. Again, they use words differently than us. He doesn't mean wonderful like wonderful. He means wonderful like crazy. This heresy, not even plausible, but making speculations, again, he's making it up, against him that is, that he be not. He's, he's speaking of Jesus, who is, I am. And he's saying he was not. He's speculating this. And everywhere putting forward blasphemy for reverent language. Again, that sounds a little bit like Jew, right? They blaspheme things that they don't understand. And again, not quite as bad as those that preceded it. It doesn't fully disconnect Jesus from the God of the Scriptures like Marcionism. It doesn't only apply the divine nature of Christ to Jesus after his baptism, rejecting his preexistence, glorious preexistence, and his virgin birth. All Arianism does is denied to Jesus eternal preexistence, uncreatedness. Is that a big, Andre? 
I don't mean to interrupt, but even all of this um, <clears throat> denial of Jesus and all of this blasphemy of Jesus, these people can still be forgiven. Jesus said there was only one unforgivable sin, and that's you know the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. So he said that people would speak against him like that, but there's a chance they could still be saved. Yeah, so I would say that it's not likely that someone, especially a teacher leading folks in this, would be saved. In fact, Athanasius is going to make the argument that you can't have salvation. God, Jesus can't save the world apart from being divine himself and being of the essence of the Father. That's his argument. What I would just say is even in the situation where in the Gospels he said, hey, you're blaspheming the Holy Spirit, if you recall, even in that case, they were speaking against Jesus. They were attributing his works to, his work to the devil. Him. So I don't know that you would make that fine of a distinction and say if someone is you know, speaking against Jesus in this way, that it's not a very serious thing because it's not against the Spirit, it's against Jesus. I, I don't know that I can sort all that out uh, no, very no, I, well, but I would, be, yeah, I would be hesitant to say that. Okay. <clears throat> is it a big deal? I mean, Andre just helped us answer whether it's a big deal. Is it a big deal? Is this authority? Is this authority denying blasphemy of making Jesus more like us, less of the glorious person He is? The early church thought it was, as you you know heard in the quotes provided from Athanasius. A little bit of poison, even if it's less than Marcion introduced, is still uh, dangerous. It's still deadly. And this idea was contended against vigorously by the early church. Now, similarly, unlike Marcionism, which doesn't exist, or I should say dissimilarly, Marcionism doesn't exist anymore. I can't point to somebody who holds that today. Adoptionism, I could find somebody. It'd be hard. It's not hard to find somebody who believes this, right? Can you think of anybody? Mormons. Okay, I, I didn't know that. So say oh, more. I mean, their their belief is as man is God once as man is God once was as God is man may become. Okay. So they would even go a step farther and say even God Father was created in a previous existence. Amazing. They don't believe there is one true God. There is there there are little gods reaching back into eternity past. Right? Who is this? So, Mormonism. So yeah, and I don't know much about Mormonism. Uh, Jehovah's Witnesses is the ones that I've, and I'll tell a story here in just a second, that I've spent more time with. Mm -hmm. Jehovah's Witnesses are, are straight, the other doctrine, Unitarians. So there's a number of groups that hold this doctrine today. It's very relevant still. Very relevant. I, I was in California, and um, you know, Jehovah's Witnesses came to our house. And, well, no, and, and, I, and I spoke to them and had a good conversation. And um, they said, hey, we're going to send somebody else. Is that okay? Because... They were nice ladies, but they, you know, I just said, I don't, I want to talk to you about Jesus. I want to say, here's the difference, here's why. And they said, hey, we'll send somebody else. And they sent a very intelligent man. And I was a new seminary student. I didn't know a lot. And uh, he turned me in circles. Like, I, I did, I could not answer his questions. Um, and, you know, and he's going to use, I'm going to share that a little bit later. Some of these, I think it's hard. Some of them, I think, are hard to refute. Um, I can't, I think we can. But they're just not easy. Um, but it's it's very much. I mean, you've probably spoken with Jehovah's Witnesses. You've had an opportunity. This is a this is very much alive and well. Uh, and again, this is a little bit more difficult. I'd say much more difficult to refute than the previous two. It doesn't deny vast quantity of scriptures like Marcionism. You can't just say, "Hey, you are making this stuff up." Like, forget it. You're in you're in big trouble. Like, don't be creating gods. You know can't do that and it doesn't simply require reading comprehension I feel like like it does to refute adoptionism there are scriptures I would say which on the surface sound like Arianism is the correct view I'm going to read to you four of them now and these are the four texts that we'll be looking at in the four subsequent weeks that I'll be teaching two more in June two in July I've ordered these again for a purpose that I'll share later um, but I'd say they ended up uh, being, for the most part, in order of increasingly difficult to explain. That's not the purpose of my ordering, but they ended up kind of being that way. And I don't think any of them are easy. So the first, Colossians 1.15. In a section that is very much devoted to exalting Christ, you have this phrase. Christ is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. The firstborn of all creation. What does that mean? 
the firstborn of all creation. Well, Arius and others would tell you it means that he's the first one to be created. And then he, in turn, created all things. Is that what it means? No, but it does sound uh, kind of hard to explain. This one's harder. Revelation 3.14, the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God, says this. Revelation 3.14, the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God, says this, talking about Jesus. And then Proverbs 8, I, I, some of our modern English translations have uh, translated it in a way that I think is reasonable, but doesn't show sort of the difficulty that this was the primary verse of the Arians, which is why uh, it's harder than it seems maybe when you read it in your, your, the, your, your translation likely says, the Lord possessed me at the beginning of his work. The New Revised Standard Version says, the Lord created me, wisdom. He's talking about wisdom, right? Folly, Dame Folly and Lady Wisdom are being contrasted all through the beginning of Proverbs. And he's saying, the Lord created me, wisdom, at the beginning of his work, the first of his acts of long ago. And 1 Corinthians 1.24 equates the wisdom of God with Christ. To those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. So does that mean the Lord created Christ at the beginning of his work, the first of his acts of long ago? Sounds like it. I don't believe that. It sounds like it. And lastly, John 21, 17, when Jesus is resurrected, and he's speaking, I think, to Mary here, right? And says, I hope I have that right. I'm ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Let me just, does anybody, can anybody make sure I'm right on that or know before I turn? I think he's talking to Mary when she's, um, she's saying, don't cling to me, because I have not yet ascended, isn't that right? Yes, isn't that right? Okay. So he's saying, don't, hey, don't cling to me. I've not yet ascended to my father and your father, to my God and your God. It sure sounds like he's saying, hey, you know, Mary, we've got something in common. And that is, we both have a God. And it's the Father. And Jesus might be called God in the same way that leaders, even leaders in Israel were time. Remember Jesus said, I said you are gods. And he's talking about leaders. I mean, leaders are sometimes referred to with that appellation. But we know that those leaders were not gods. They were just serving. Or remember what he said to Moses? This is probably the easiest example. He said to Moses, when Moses didn't want to go talk to the Israelites, he said, hey, Aaron's going to be... You, how did, who was the prophet? Who was God? One of them was the spokesperson. It, it could have been Moses. Aaron had to be the spokesperson because that was the point. Moses couldn't speak well. Right. You're going to be God to Pharaoh, and Aaron would be as your prophet. You know, well, we know Moses wasn't God. He just means in the place of God, or, or Satan is what? He's the God of this world. What does that mean? Well, he's, he rules over it, right? Is he God, true God of true no. God? No. I mean, he's a very glorious, amazing being, yes, but he's not true God of true God. And, and Jesus is that way. He, has, he knows who the real God is. It's the same God that Mary has. They have the same God. It's his God. Jesus is called God, but in the same way that Satan might be called God, or Moses might be called God, or leaders might be called God. That's the argument. Now, here they are on the calendar, so the actual dates that we'll cover each of these. These are four of the texts that were presented to me by that Jehovah's Witness in California. They're also some of the scriptures used by Arius and his followers in the days of Athanasius. And I'll read one more thing, and we're, we're almost done. Um, this is Athanasius one more time. It's not on the screen, but he said, Thus they misunderstand the passage in Proverbs. The Lord has created me, a beginning of his ways. For his works. And then he lists some other passages. And straight away they argue that the Son of God is a work and a creature. But although they might have learned from what is said above, although they should have learned from all the other arguments that he's made, had they not utterly lost their power of apprehension, that the Son is not from nothing, nor in the number of things originate at all. Christ isn't counted among those things that are created, he says, the truth witnessing to that fact. Yet since, as if dreading to desert their own fiction, they are accustomed to allege the aforesaid passages, including Proverbs, of divine scripture, which have a good meaning, but are by them practiced on. Let us proceed afresh to take up the question of the sense or the meaning of these scriptures, to remind the faithful, and to show from each of these passages that they, the Arians, have no knowledge of Christianity at all. And that's our task over the next four weeks. Each of those four passages, according to Athanasius, or in the same way that Athanasius said, each of those four passages have a good meaning. 
They have a good meaning. And it's our part, like Athanasius did to those in his day, it's our part to proceed afresh to take up to the question of the meaning of these, to show the faithful uh, what the right meaning and knowledge of that is so that we don't blaspheme Christ. For the next four weeks, we'll take up the same purpose as Athanasius, I just said that, who did it just about 1,700 years ago, and we'll try to show the good meaning of each of these passages, starting with Colossians 1.15 next Sunday. Okay, any questions before we end? Okay, all right, let's pray, and then we'll be dismissed. Lord, we thank you again. We thank you for this morning. We thank you for your word. We thank you for people, people in the past like Alexander and Athanasius and Tertullian and Irenaeus and all these who did what Jude, what you through Jude asked. God, they contended for the faith that had once for all been delivered. And as we stand 2,000 years later looking at a faith that's hard to understand just what's right. It's we're, we're farther down the road. We don't have the apostles to say, this is what we're teaching everywhere. It's years have gone by and there's a lot of questions. And yet, God, we love you. We don't want to not know you. We don't want to be deceived. We want to know the truth, even though it's hard. And so give us the grace to understand. Give us the grace to know your word. Give us the grace to understand difficult passages, which are about glorious things that are beyond our comprehension, way beyond, uh, Father, our knowledge or our, our sight or our understanding, but that you've revealed and that we should worship you appropriately and accurately. Give us the grace to be able to do that. Thank you for those, again, who preceded us. Thank you for your Holy Spirit and not leaving us as orphans so that we have everything we need. Give us the grace to understand these in the weeks to come. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.